Good morning. Welcome to today's celebration. I'm your lay leader, Bob Zirko. For those of you that don't know me, you may be better off that way. Thank you for joining us in our celebration this morning. Please take a few minutes to um, fill out the communication and prayer request form inside your bulletin. Those prayers will be sent to our prayer chain and remembered throughout the week. So um, please take time to complete that. You're welcome to make use of our family worship room just outside in the West Wing where the um, service is broadcast there. Today is our quarterly meeting after worship um, and then followed by our potluck salad Sunday. And this just in, there will be a short VBS meeting this Thursday at 6 p.m. This Thursday at 6 p.m., a short VBS meeting. I'll give this to you. You like that color. I know. Are there any other announcements this morning? Janet. Uh, work day here at the church. Please join us to help, uh, especially a lot of things outside, clean up and inside. It is uh, Saturday, July 14th at 8 a.m. When it's nice and cool in the morning, you can come, a later. You can come at eight fifteen, but make sure you're you know we are here at eight. Um, so please join us. We could use the help uh, if you can bring any equipment for outside work. That would be awesome as well. And there is a list of the things, the jobs that we want to get completed in the Narthex. So if you want to take a glance at that, I know Bill Luke is really excited about getting signed up for that. So. Um, Please take a look at that list. Any other announcements? Cruise night every Tuesday night at 7? 4. Come here at 4. It starts at 7, but we'd really like you to be here at 4. It starts at 5. Why did I think 7? Uh, obviously, I haven't been here. I can't make Tuesday nights. But um, be here at 4. It starts at 5. Sorry. Be here at 4. starts at 5. We could use some help uh, with that, or if you just want to come and, and hang out, that's great too. Anything else that I can mess up? Well, there's probably a whole list of things. but uh, Let's see if, uh, let me look at the announcements in the back here. Um, Thursday the 19th is family prayer time. August 16th is family prayer time. So the third Thursday of the, of the month at 6.30 p.m. And then Sunday, August 26th is our Church in the Woods at Village Green Park. All right, seeing no other uh, announcements, we'll continue with our call to worship. I heard a strong voice out of heaven saying, salvation and power are established. Kingdom of our God, authority of his Messiah, the accuser of our brothers and sisters thrown out, who accused them day and night before God. They defeated him through the blood of the Lamb and the blood and the bold word of their testimonies. They weren't in love with, them, with themselves. They were willing to die for Christ. So rejoice, O heavens, and all who live there, but doomed to earth and sea. For the devil's come down on you with both feet. He's had a great fall. He's wild and raging with anger. He hasn't much time, and he knows it. But remember, he is defeated through the blood of the Lamb and the bold word of our testimony. Please stand and join me in the praise hymn, number 110, 525, and 677.
Let's pray together, shall we? Father, as we gather ourselves here in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That, Father, today we can give glory and honor unto your holy name, that we can stand upon the solid rock of your word, and, Father, never worry about the enemy that comes in like a flood. For you raise up a standard, our God, and that standard is the word, the word made flesh, Jesus. So today, in the name of Christ, we ask, Lord, that you would open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing and an anointing upon this service, touch our hearts, encourage us, Father, to be all that we could be in spite of all that we know that we are. For, Father, I feel as the Apostle Paul, the chiefest of sinners, but God, above all things, I know that it's the blood that gives me the standing with you. So today... May we recognize our place with you and give you glory and honor in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. And everybody here said, Amen. Amen. Page 43, please be seated. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fails. Well, hopefully, you've had time to fill out your prayer request form. If you haven't, then please, as the collection plate comes around, the offering plate, then you can put it in there. But Drew, would you help us with this? And we're going to sing page, uh, bind us together. Whatever page that is. I think that's page six, uh, six who? 690.
Let's pray. Father, truly, we thank you for the gift of prayer. God, that we have the opportunity, we have the ability, and we have the right to come to the throne. For, Father, your word tells us, approach the throne of grace boldly. God, it is only because of your amazing grace that we can do that. But today we thank you, Father, that you've given us that grace that we can bring these requests to you. Request, Father, to, for salvation. Request, Father, for those who need to have relationships repaired, for finances, healing, Lord, all sorts of things. But God, we know above all things that your will for us is that we be in health, even as, your, as our soul prospers. So, Father, I ask you today to encourage our soul, strengthen us, build us, give us, give us today your presence in this service. Meet these needs, Father, we pray in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Today's scripture is from Isaiah 51, verses 4 through 8. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and my arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like the wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. There you are. Got a nice little dress on today. Look at that. You got the yellow bow and everything. Yellow bow. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's yellow as well, too. Look at that. Your mansion. However, we're going to have to go back a couple pages here. And actually, we have a story from Judges 4. And look, she's got the same little, little bow you got. Yes, yellow. Yes, yeah. Mom. Exactly. So this is called a brave new leader. So it's in the year after Joshua, the Israelites settled in many parts of Canaan, but they did not have all the land that God promised them. As the time went I by, don't like yeah, she's like, where's all that land? Where do you think that land's at? Right there? Yeah, her hair kind of looks like land. At the time, they forgot their duty to God. They did not even live by the rules. Four weeks later, God sent Gabriel to the town of the Nazareth in Galilee. A young man named Mary, a young woman named Mary lived there. Gabriel had a message for Mary too. Every place Jesus went, he took the people. Turn back to God. One day in Galilee, Jesus was walking along the shore of the lake, and he saw two brothers. To close, your sharing prayer. Lord, we thank you that you can be trusted. Help us to be the people whom the others can trust. Forgive us when we are not trustworthy. We trust you, Lord. Amen. Treat others the way you want to treat them. That is very good. All right, I think we're done. <laughs> Tune in next time. It was kind of a pick your adventure style today.
should have shut that one off. Okay, praise the Lord. I love it when a plan comes together, don't you? Praise God. Would the uh, ushers come forward, please, and we'll receive our uh, morning offering. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for gifts, tithes, and offerings. We thank you for time, talent, and treasure. But most of all, Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus and the gift of salvation. And God, that we may be wise stewards of everything that you've given to us. And may we freely share as we freely receive. We ask this blessing in Christ's name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Please be seated and sing with me. That's amen. 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 Okay. John, you're going to get a double dose today. You mean let me preach too? You want to? <laughs> no, he heard this sermon about an hour and a half ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guarantee you it won't be the same way. Revelation chapter 12, verses 11 and 12 says this, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell therein. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil came down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has such a short time. That's the New King James Version. I would like to read to you from a version called The Message. And I'm only reading it for the, for the one little thing, but uh, I'll read the whole thing. They defeated him through the blood of the Lamb and the bold word of their testimony. They weren't in love with themselves. They were willing to die for Christ. So rejoice, O heavens, and all ye who live there, but doomed to the earth and sea. For the devil's come down on you with both feet. He's had a great fall. He's wild and raging with anger. He hasn't much time and he knows it. 
I don't know about you, but one of my prayers every morning is even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I know that that's a selfish prayer and that I'm looking for God to come and snatch me out of all this craziness in this world. Wouldn't that be nice? And everybody said, Amen. But God is tearing for reason. Peter tells us that he's tearing because there's just one more that might come. The importance of one soul saved is probably way beyond our pay grade to understand what that means. I don't know about you, but there's something that lights a fire under me. It's when I hear testimonies. When I hear what God has done in someone's life. You see, testimonies light a fire under me because I think of it as a way, if God did it for them, then he can surely, no, I'm not calling you surely, he can surely do it for me. If he did it for Moses, if he did it for Ruth, if he did it for Rahab, if he did it for all of the people we read of in the Bible, what's wrong? Why can't he do it here today in 2018? I don't know about you, but I could use a miracle. How many here could use a miracle today? Really? Good job. I believe that God is in the miracle business, not in just pushing out little uh, placebos. Hmm. You see, I could use one. Maybe, maybe that's why Revelation 12, 11 puts such great importance on sharing their testimonies. Notice how we triumph over the enemy. It says the blood of the lamb and their testimony, 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 testimony. I feel like T.D. Jakes. Testimony, testimony, testimony. We overcome by what? You should not be allowed to speak in these services. <laughs> We overcome. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that the saints, who would that be? Do we have any saints in here? Let me see how many saints we have. Well, the rest of you better get canonized real quick because the Bible says that we are all saints. We're priests unto God. Okay? Notice how we triumph? By the blood of the Lamb and the testimony. When God answers a prayer, no matter how big or small you may think it is, we need to turn it into praise. For you see, if we don't turn a prayer, an answered prayer into praise, it shortly becomes pride. Look what I did. Hey, I made it through that. I can make it through anything. Let me tell you what. Every day is a miracle for me. Every day that I'm able to put one foot in front of the other. Every day that I look in the mirror and I think to myself, how did you get this old this fast? Is a miracle because I shouldn't even be here. Giving testimony is a way to give God all the glory. But we also need to share it because others need to hear it too. If we don't share our testimonies of how God is working in our lives, then we're tempted to think that he isn't working at all. I know people that don't think God works. I know people that think that God just sets up in heaven, he started all this, and he's just watching it now, wondering how it's all going to pan out. Do you know my God, the God that I serve, the God of the Bible, the God of the, the, that I've chosen to believe, he knows how it's going to come out. He wrote to us in a letter called the book of Revelation to John, the revelation of Jesus Christ to his disciple John. He wrote how it's going to come out and he said that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. I came prepared today, not as prepared as I was last week, but I'm prepared. 
I'm going to ask this question before I plug this in. And the, the question is, how many of you have a testimony today? One, two, three, that's it? Four? Four testimonies? Every answered prayer needs to be turned into praise because if it doesn't get turned into praise and a testimony, it becomes pride. Jesus triumphed over the enemy by his shed blood. Think of it this way. Jesus broke the curse of sin so we could break the cycle of sin. Does that mean that once we accept Christ, we're, we're sinless? If it does, I'm in a world of trouble. If it does, I need to get saved every morning, every five minutes, every three minutes, every minute, every tick of the clock. Because let me tell you something. I am not perfect. I know you think I think I am. But I am not. I know that for a fact. I know me better than you know me, and you, know, you think you know me pretty well. She thinks she knows me, but I know what goes through here. Jesus overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by his blood on Calvary's cross. But the way we seal the victory, the way we seal the victory, it's sort of like the Cubs. Going into the ninth inning, leading by 15 runs, would we consider that a pretty good ending to the game? It's not sealed until the fat lady sings. And the fat lady doesn't sing until that guy in the blue uniform hollers out, strike three, three outs, game over. Hmm. But we can seal our victory. By our testimony. You see, they also do another real important thing. They remind the enemy that he's defeated. I don't know if you've ever had a real enemy, somebody that wanted to do you harm, and you walked up to them and put your face in their face and said, well, take your best shot. I don't know any of us that are that brazen. I'll use that word. But every morning, you get out of bed and declare yourself a Christian. You shake your finger in old Slewfoot's face and you say, I overcome you by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. If you don't have a testimony, let me explain a few things to you. I wonder if the lack of awe in many churches today is directly attributable to the act of testimony. Churches that see people radically saved. I don't mean somebody that comes down, takes a class, signs a paper, gets their name on the book and says, now I'm a member. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody that's had a life-changing experience with God. You say, well, I, I've accepted Christ. I didn't have a life-changing. I'm living my life the same way I lived it 30 years ago when I walked down the aisle and shook the preacher's hand. Good for you. Are you edifying God? Are you glorifying God? Are you edifying the church? You see, if we give our testimony, 
when we share our testimony, we're learning, lo lo man, I had trouble with this this morning. I still have. We're loaning our faith to someone else. When we hear a testimony, we're borrowing someone's faith. How many of you were really encouraged with Stella's testimonies of healing? I was. How many of you are encouraged when you hear someone stand up and say, you know, I once was sick and now I'm fine, I'm doing well. Look at Stacy Tedimer. He was old and decrepit when he moved out to Oklahoma. Now he's running around able to do what he's able to do, right? I'm giving him a hard time. And I think a lot of it has to do with his testimony. A lot of it has to do with the lady sitting very close to his right side. Is that true or not? Exactly right. You see, when we share our testimony and loan our faith to others, and we listen to testimony and borrow their faith, either way the church gets glorified. Either way we lift up the church, and then God says, wow, that's neat glory you're giving to me. In the worlds of criminal justice, in, the, in, in, in educational research, we see a big difference between first-hand testimony and second-person testimony, don't we? First-person witness is more credible because they actually saw what happened with their own eyes. Second-person testimony is hearsay. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It just doesn't carry the weight. Well, I didn't see it, but I heard about it. We all have heard of, of the tragedy and, and all of the heroics that's going on over in Thailand to get those, those students out of the cave. And we get, I get teary-eyed when I read some of it, and I think to myself, goodness, that's wonderful. But I'm not there. I'm not there firsthand. If I was there firsthand, I'd be a blubbering idiot. Why do you think I was a blubbering idiot with her? Because I was there firsthand. I saw when the doctor walked in and skipped around and said, no cancer. You say, yeah, but that's a big thing. What about all the little miracles that I receive every day? The ones where God has to move mountains. The one where God has to change hearts. The one where God tells me when to turn right and turn left. You say, well, he doesn't talk to me that way. Well, the only way to get God to talk to you that way is you have to spend time with him. You see, an eyewitness testimony is powerful in part because it can't, you can't argue with it. I was there. Hmm. Therefore, personal testimony is our secret weapon. And that's why the enemy wants to keep our testimony secret. He wants you to sit on your testimony. He wants you to keep it quiet. He doesn't want you to say the great things God has done for you. Did you drive here today? Did you have electricity in your home? Do you have food in your refrigerator? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have shoes on your feet, clothes on your back? Try living in Thailand. Just try living on a reservation here in, in our country, an Indian reservation, and see, see how rich you appear there. You see, he wants to keep your testimony a secret. It's not a testimony if we don't share it with others. If we don't share our testimony, we're robbing God of the glory he deserves, and we aren't holding out on, we're not just holding out on God, we're holding out on everybody else and me and you both. Our churches are filled with heresy. No, I'm sorry, hearsay. Our churches are filled with hearsay. What we need is some first-hand, first-person, real testimonies for God. No amount of education can compensate for the lack of first-person experience. We rarely get a testimony in a classroom. We only get testimonies when we're tested and put in a thing called the crucible. You know what a crucible is? It's that pot that they melt gold down in, gold ore down in, and they get it so hot that the ore becomes liquid and all the crud floats to the top, you take a stick and scrape it off. That's called dross. And then it's not very clear. It's real mucky and yucky. You get it hot again, and you melt it again, and more stuff comes up. And you do that 
many, many times until the gold becomes pure. You can actually see your face in pure gold. And then guess what? Each time they had to bring it to a liquid, the heat had to be turned up 10% hotter each time. Did you not know that God said that you are gold refined in a fire? Not one of us here has not been in some kind of a refiner's fire to get us where we are today. But praise God, he's bringing us out. You see, if we pass the test, then we get a testimony. That testimony's worth far more than degree or diploma can afford. And the first person experience with God will override all of our inadequacies. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Peter and John were described this way by the Pharisees. Unlearned and ignorant men, yet the Jewish council was amazed at their boldness. And it simply says this, they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. They didn't know where they came from. They didn't know what they did. They didn't know any of the things they had. All they knew of is that they had been with Jesus. With this said, I want you not to be afraid of the crucible. But let's go back to our opening scripture. They overcame what? Everything. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Nothing can compare to the power of first-hand testimonies. The most educated scholarly second-hand testimony still cannot compare with first-hand witness. Please. I've been to every Bible study. I've been to every church growth seminar. I've been to every leadership seminar that John Maxwell ever put on. I've done all those things. And my friends, let me tell you what. The best thing I've ever done is have a relationship with Jesus Christ. All of those things are good. But you can't educate a testimony. You see, if we get a testimony then we can change the world. If we change the world, then maybe, maybe the kingdom will come. Remember the Samaritan woman? John chapter 4, verses 7 through 30, and then verses 39 through 42. The woman was totally transformed. Remember that? She came there, a Samaritan, beat down, hunkered down, looked up, and Jesus asked her for some water, and she says, what are you asking me water for? You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You know, I'll back off and wait till you're done. He said, no, give me the drink. She says, you don't want my water. He says, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me of the water. And she says, you don't have anything to dip with. And he said, I'm talking about water that's different than that water. I'm talking about living water. And if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. She says, go get, he, he said to her, go get your husband. She said, I ain't got a husband. He said, you said right, lady. You've had five and the one you're with ain't yours. She said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You've told me everything. She runs back into town and tells all the ch church elders, all the leaders, all them big shots, you know, the ones that are big in the, in the temple. She runs back and tells them all and they go, well, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing that this guy knew who you were. But let me share something with you. She went back to her village and shared her testimony. That testimony sparked faith in those who heard. Remember Romans 10, 17, it says, Then so faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But their faith was secondhand. They had secondhand faith. How many of you have heard people talk about how grandma's going to get them into heaven because grandma went ahead of them? Grandma can't get you into heaven. Mommy can't get you into heaven. Only Jesus can get you there. But their faith was secondhand. They needed their own encounter with Jesus. That's the whole point of, of us coming here on Sunday. We all need our own encounter with Jesus. I'm not talking about some radical run down the aisle, throw your hands up, scream and holler, I'm relieved, I'm saved. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a bona fide, honest relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And most of us in this world today go through the motion. 
They needed their own encounter with Jesus, and that's exactly what they got. The transition from secondhand to firsthand faith is evident in their words. Listen to what they said. Now we believe. Now we believe. Not just because of what this woman told us, but because of what we've heard. We saw him firsthand. Hmm. We cannot live off someone else's experiences forever. Secondhand faith is as dangerous as secondhand smoke. We need a faith that's our, with our own name on it. We need to own it, and it needs to own us. We can't just know what we believe. We need to know why we believe what we believe. We can't just know what we believe. Well, I believe in these seven things. Okay, why? Why do you believe that God is infinite? Well, because Bob told me. Why do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Well, because I heard it in Sunday school. First-hand information. That's why God gave us his testament. And it must continually be upgraded. I don't know about you, but I get so frustrated at Windows 10, I could throw my computer across the room. Every time I shut it off, it says, do not turn off your computer, we're adding updates. So I wait and wait and wait and wait, and it goes 2%, 3%, 5%. Half hour later, it says 15%. I go do some stuff and come back, and it's done and shut off. And I go, wow. I go home and turn it on, and it says, wait a minute, we're adding your updates now to your system. But that's exactly what God wants to do to us. That's why we go to Bible study. That's why we study our Bible. That's why we don't read it once and lay it down. Because it's constantly being upgraded in us. The Word's not changing. We're changing every day. If nothing else, I'm getting older every day. Stop it. (laughs) Don't just be satisfied by simply going to church. Come here expecting to be in God's presence, not mine. I'm, I'm just a little knob on a great big tree very little knob but friends I know what I believe and I know why I believe it because I once was lost but now I'm found I was blind but now I see I was involved in drugs and alcohol and all kinds of other things that you wouldn't appreciate like stealing and lying and cheating and by rights I shouldn't be here able to even stand before you today When I was 21 years old, a doctor told me to go home and die. 330 pounds, blood pressure 110 over 210. He looked at me and was afraid to put the blood pressure cuff on me. Simple prayer. God, if you're real. And God said, boy, I'm going to show you what real is. Six months later, first of all, the next morning I got up, I did not have a desire for heroin or alcohol again. Six months later, I weighed 198 pounds. But I will tell you this, don't you dare bargain with God the way I did. I said, if you'll do that, I'll do anything you ask, and that's why I'm here at Plymouth. That was a joke you were supposed to laugh. Don't just be satisfied with simply going. Be. Most of us are educated way beyond our level of obedience. I bet you everybody in here can quote an obedience verse of some kind. 
I read a book and it said this. Wouldn't it be unique to read the Bible this way? That every time we read it and we came to a, a verse that said do something, we closed the Bible, got up and went and did it. And we didn't come back until we had co completed that errand. Wouldn't that be an incredible way to do things? Most of us would never get through the Bible. Because we'd find an excuse. I've got an excuse for everything in the world. How about you? I've got 10 minutes. Would anybody be willing to share a short testimony so that there's others they could share too? Anybody? you will be willing you come up I cannot go without saying a testimony because of what God did for me in healing my body and I got to spend last week with my twin sister She's 33 minutes older than me, and I kept reminding her that I was the baby all week. I'm the baby. But it was wonderful to see how our Christian lives have gone. She ministers. She has a radio, Christian radio program, and to see, and we got to share with each other Christ. And we hadn't been able to do that. It had been five years since I'd seen her. And she has a radio program. And I got to share my testimony of how God healed me in Buffalo, New York. And it was amazing. People would call in and talk to us, and, and it was just amazing. But I can't go without saying how much I love God. And he's not done with me yet. I've got so much ministry to do yet in my life. And that's why he saved me. Floor's open. If you can get out of the pew. I've got my brake pedal in your pew. It's like it's in the pew in the corner. It's going to make my wife nervous. Making me nervous. I know. You know how long I can <laughs> preach. Huh? For those of you who don't know me, I'm Stacy Tadmer, and I've known Bill. How many, how many years have we known each other? Nineteen. Nineteen? I came to the track in 1999. Okay. I didn't make the first year, two th or I was, there, I was there the first year. So I've known Bill, I've known the Lewis that long, too, probably. But, uh, and, and you knew my first wife. Mm -hmm. I was married to a wonderful Christian woman, and her mother's here with me this morning. Uh, and we had a wonderful life together, and, and everybody saw how different we were. And he said, you know what? You ought to write a book about how different your life has been. Well, I started writing that, and I mentioned in there that uh, when I was in the, got out of the high school and before I went into the service, I was engaged to this beautiful, dark-haired girl in New Jersey. And uh, while I was in the service, we went our separate directions. I got to, she's going to not like this, but I got a Dear John letter. The, the, the good news is, though, she sent another letter after that saying that she made a mistake and she wanted me to come. I never got the second letter. And I am convinced now that God put that letter in his pocket. And he walked around laughing and saying, boy, watch, watch what I'm going to do with these guys in 52 years. Amen. And because of that book, people told me, well, if you're going to mention her, you're going to have to let her know that you're talking about her. So I tracked her down through social media sent her an email and told her what I was doing. She said, well, I'm not going to give you permission until I read what you wrote about me. So I sent it to her, and she said, well, you didn't write anything bad at all. Yeah, you can use that. Well, through that, my wife at the time was fighting a very severe illness, and God chose not to heal her but take her home because she was too good to live in this world anyway. Amen. And uh, But my wife passed away, and, 
and Jerry and I started talking to each other on the phone and sending emails and birthday cards and Christmas cards and that kind of stuff. For five years, we did that. Sometimes as many as six and seven hours a week on the phone. We decided, we, you know what, we ought to get together and see each other again. So we did, in August of 2015, I flew out to Tulsa, Arizona and met her for the first Tulsa, time in Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Well, you don't know, maybe they moved it. They, but I flew out there and we spent five days together out there and then she flew to Chicago, Ohio. Illinois. Yeah. Uh, and, and she spent five days here and then we got back on the phone, we were talking to each other again and we said, you know what? I believe God is putting us back together again. And we were so convinced that God put us together again that after seeing each other in August and September, October the 2nd, 2015, we got married. And there is absolutely no doubt in either one of our minds that God has put us together and we know what he wants us doing. We're in a senior adult community and we're dealing with all of these people who can't do things for themselves and Jerry and I are helping them out. And we're just having a wonderful time. And then I brought her back here last year and we spent a week with my first wife's mother now that can make you nervous, <laughs> but they are both lovely Christian ladies and they've adopted each other. Praise and it's been absolutely wonderful. So I'll, I won't preach anymore. Okay. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Anyone else? Beth, can you come up here? <laughs> I'll come as far as I can. How's that? Well, me. I know it's not much. It's a tear's shell of what I was. But I do know without my faith, I would not be here today. I prayed and I prayed. And I know my family did not think I would make it. But he brought me back. Amen. One more. All righty. You want to come up? We'll sing our last song. If you would stand, please, and turn to page 519. I believe it says, It is well with my soul. Father, indeed, we declare it well with our soul. No matter what the crucible is, no matter what the trials are, the test, no matter how it is, we come out through the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. God, sometimes we don't see how it could ever work, but because you have created within us the desire and the hunger to follow you, God, I pray that today you take this message, encourage us with it, Father, that we may be bold 
as Peter and John walking into the temple, though they were unlearned men. They even said they were ignorant. But Father, you can't be ignorant when you've made the best decision of your life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, bless us, send us forth, bless our meeting that's to come, and we will give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said...